from the belt to the plate. A swing and a miss. And that's the winner. That's the winner. A World Series winner for the Cardinals. Smith corks one in the right down the line. It may go. Go crazy, folks. Go crazy. It's a home run. And the Cardinals have won the game by the score of three to two. Welcome to That's the Winner Podcast. I am Ryan Jenkins, and with me as always is Josh Brown. Josh, welcome. Uh, we're going to be joined here by Katie Wu in just a minute. So, Josh, let's um, talk about what just happened this evening and um, the Cy Young Award going to Sandy Alcantara. Now, that could be a little um, jawing, jarring to um, some Cardinals fans because Sandy Alcantara swept with uh, 30, all 30 first-place votes, former Cardinal, in the Ozuna trade. Um, how do you feel about that? Does it make you a little upset? <laughs> pain. So much pain. We're going to be haunted by this Marcelo Zuna trade forever, aren't we? Did you see who finished fifth in the voting? I did. I saw um, uh, it- Helsley had one fifth-place vote. Yeah. From, yeah, one from, vote. From John Ditton. That, that covers the Cardinals, okay. yeah. Right. MLB.com. He also had a vote in for uh, Edwin Diaz. He voted oh. for two relievers. That. Nice that of, was nice of him. That was very interesting. Um, no, uh, Zach Galen finished fifth. I saw that. Uh, as who well. was the other counterpart? We sent him, both he and Alcantara in that trade uh, for Ozuna. Man, we knew this was coming. I mean, Alcantara these last couple of years has been lights out, and it's not surprising. I think it, it is painful as a Cardinals fan to see it. Now we bet on Jack Flaherty and Alex Reyes. Yeah. And it has not paid off how we wanted it to. All right, Katie's with us now. Let me pull her up. There's Katie. Hi, Katie. Welcome to the show. It's hey been guys. about a it's been about a year since you were with us last. I think almost exactly a year. Um, so a lot's happened in that in that year. Um, yeah, tell me about it, it. It's your second year with the Cardinals, right? And on the Cardinals beat. So, how was it different from the first year? Um, you know, the 17 game win streak in the first year. You know, big moments like that. But this year was like. Hall of Fame type stuff with Albert Pujols and uh, the retirement of Yachty. Like, how is that different for you this year? And is it like a dream come true? I don't know, like, what your aspirations is or how far you want to go. But, like, is this, like, as about as good as it gets minus winning the World Series for the team you cover? Yeah, it was, it was definitely different. And it starts with something that that is just so obvious. I mean, we had clubhouse access this year. and We did not have that in 2021. And it was really difficult my rookie season to try to make these connections with this team, with this organization, and not really meet any of them face to face until right around the all-star break. Right. So for me, being able to, whenever the lockout was lifted to be able to go into the clubhouse for the first time and immediately have these face to face conversations that completely changed, I think how I covered the team in 2022, but it was really surreal. Um, you know, as a media member, as a beat writer, you try really hard uh, to be objective about what's going on. And you never want to get too attached, too high, too low. It's not your job. Your job is to remain so like super impartial. And I feel like I've gotten pretty good at doing that. Um, but Albert Pujols and what he did, just coming back the second half, the chase for 700, how he wasn't just like a reunion and a retirement ceremony tour for him. He was one of, if not their best players, most impactful players in the second half to witness all of that, that magical storybook run. I mean, you think about what happened in the 2022 season before the wild card series. <laughs> and there's there's so many storylines. There's Albert, there's Yachty. I mean, you have a 66% chance that you have an MVP name tomorrow that's from the Cardinals. Just, I really enjoyed the season and I felt for fans after game one of that wild card series because it seemed pretty pretty clear that it would take some sort of miracle for them to win the rest of the series. And as we know, that did not happen. Yeah. We felt the pain of that for sure. Oh yeah. <laughs> that I, game. I, I try not to go backwards, but I thought I would ask you about this season because I, how important and how fun it should have been for you to be able to cover it. I know you grew up as a baseball fan. So like that had to be just like dream come true to be able to cover that, that type of those types of moments. Ahead, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, especially when, you know, not to date myself too much, but I remember when I was a kid and 
Albert Pujols is much watched television for me, even as a child growing up in the Bay Area. So to be able to see that and cover him as a professional and see him light up Bush Stadium exactly how he did during my childhood, I sometimes, especially for 700, I mean, those last five, 695 to 700, I will never forget what that was like, that like sitting on the edge of your seat, you'd close your laptop screen, everyone would stop talking in the press box. It would just be silent, not just in the press box, but in the stadium. And it seemed like everybody, baseball, it doesn't matter if you're a Brewers fan, a Pirates fan, a whatever fan, baseball was rooting for a home run in every single at bat. And that was so, so special. Yeah, it was awesome to watch. And I mean, speaking of Albert too, 154 OPS plus. Katie, I mean, it seems like he got robbed of the DH Silver Slugger this year. If there was if there was a year he should have gotten it, I mean, just looking at that second half, and I know Josh Bell Raw had a pretty good year, but man, 154 OPS plus. I don't think anybody saw that coming. No, I was I was uh no discredit to Josh to Josh Bell at all, but I kind of thought Albert was gonna be the Silver Slugger Award winner. Just I, I guess we kind of forget the first half was a little a little underwhelming, but I thought he more than made up for it in the second half. Absolutely. Well, um, I was telling Ryan, I, it, we both got a chance to read your article a couple days ago on the catcher situation. Obviously, the GM meetings wrapped up. I think last week you were in Vegas for that, right? Yes, I was. How was that? Vegas is an interesting place to put a work <laughs> conference. Uh, <laughs> but it was it was a little different just because it was more spread out. What I liked about the GM meetings usually is it's a pretty small, intimate environment. The resorts are usually small, and it allows you to coincidentally run into people um there are plenty of places to hide in vegas so it was it took a little bit more uh pursuing to find people but it was it was a good time overall i like the gm meetings because it's really where teams and organizations start to put the foundation of the offseason together so it's hard and i understand i totally get the demand for this but it's hard to really hypothesize what the offseason could look like for certain teams while other teams are still in the playoffs. So for the GM meetings, for all 30 execs to be there, I mean, the Astros had such a quick turnaround. They win the World Series and immediately go to Vegas. Um, for all 30 teams and all execs to be there, you can start conversating about, hey, here's what we're looking for in 2023. Here are some parts that may be available. Here are some parts that you have. Here is maybe where we can start establishing the market price for free agents. It really is like the unofficial start to the offseason. And as we can tell over the last week, it jump started some of these trades and some of these free agent signings. Yeah. And obviously it's early on now, but, but let's, let's jump right into the catcher discussion. Cause like I said, you, you had that article a couple days ago on the athletic. Um, and I was digging in reading some of that it's a great piece. Obviously Thank all you. the, there's a lot of, there's a lot of options out there, but I wanted to read this quick part from it that stuck out to me. Uh, you were talking about catchers in general and you said Moselak's verbiage of quote, the best is not relative to, to specific traits such as offensive profile or defensive stability. He isn't necessarily relegated to a defensive stalwart. He's instead searching for the best all-around catcher, ideally that one that is cost-controlled. We've already talked about this a little bit, some of the catcher options there, but when I read that, that kind of screams Sean Murphy, does it not? I mean, that's what I, if you were going to ask me, again, I have no influence on the front office or any moves they make, but if you ask me straight up, who the best available catcher would be, regardless of circumstance, I would say Sean Murphy. Um, I would also say Alejandro Kirk a quick or a very, very close second. But if I'm looking at at those, at the, at the whole catching market, again, free agents, possible trade candidates combined, Sean Murphy stands out because he check all he checks all their boxes. I mean, he's a can hit for power, he can get on base, gold glove winner, plenty of years of control. Uh, the only thing is, of course, he's gonna be very, very desirable. The A's have right. had have had people checking in on Murphy dating back to the trade deadline and the A's are in a position to deal him because they have such significant catching depth in their minor league system, but the A's are in the middle of a rebuild. So they are going to ask for a significant haul in terms of prospects and already relatively young, high ceiling major league talent. Well, look, it was about this time a year ago when you wrote a piece about how the Cardinals were looking for probably a sinker ball pitcher. And a lot of people were throwing Marcus Stroman out there. And I said, I think Steven Matz kind of screams Cardinals. And you said, yeah, they're definitely going to be talking with him. I remember this. And it might have been like a week or two later that they signed him. So I'm just going to say now that Sean Murphy's my guy this offseason. I'm just going to go ahead and say. <laughs> oh, it. I see what he, you're doing. Okay. He's the guy. So so maybe a couple weeks, maybe a month from now, he's probably a little more desirable than Steven Matz. So it might take a long, little bit longer to get a trade down. He just he just seems like the, the type of guy that they would go after. But Katie has to back you up and agree yes. with you. That's yes. kind of how it kind of works. I mean, do you do you think out of the options that are out there, 
that that's most likely? Or what do you think on your part of it? Of like, what's most likely the Cardinals? Because the Cardinals are going to get a catcher, whether that's on the free agent market, whether that's a trade. Like, what do you think is the most likely to happen here in the off season? Correct, correct. So let, let's break this down, right? The Cardinals need a starting catcher, one hundred percent. If the season started tomorrow and you had their five man rotation of Flaherty, Wainwright, Michaelis, Mats. What's it? Montgomery, Montgomery. Oh, Montgomery. Montgomery, yeah. yes. Um, then would you feel good about that rotation? Yes. Is it a great rotation? No, but you would feel good about with that starting five. Same with the outfield. If you rolled out a starting outfield of Tyler Neal, Dylan Carlson, Lars Newbar, do you love it? No, but you like it. You can't, and, and Mo said this in his end of year press conference, you can't roll out the 2023 season with Kisner and Herrera as your two options. So they have to find a catcher. Now, if you're looking at all the different different avenues, I've said this in the story, I've said this on other radio appearances before, but the Cardinals are in a really good position because they are not by any means relegated to just free agency or just trading for a catcher. They don't need a long-term. They can find a stopgap if they want it. But if they decide a long-term option is, is their best option, they'll certainly go for it. So they have everything available to them. That being said, I do think that their best option Option again, and we're going off Mo's words here. Their best all around option is going to come in forms of a trade. They certainly have the depth to pull it off. We just are going to have to wait to see what the, the asking price is for catchers because the Cardinals are by far not the only team that needs a catcher in 2023. So they'll have to, you know, I don't think the Cardinals front office is cheap by any means. I never have. I do think they operate conservatively, but I think if we're looking at recent trends over the last several seasons, their best moves, Mo's best moves have come via trades. Absolutely. We, we've seen that with obviously Goldie and, and Nolan as well. But, you know, in historically, trading in the offseason has been cheaper than trading at the trade deadline for obvious reasons to be able to up that. So a lot of the names that are thrown out for Sean, uh, for Sean Murphy has been like Nolan Gorman in pieces. Um, what I saw today were uh, Newt or Carlson for Kirk in other pieces. Do you think the cost is that high, like Nolan Gorman high, or is it something that we're we're just overvaluing of what the trade is in the off season? That's a really good question. I think it's team specific, right? So if you're trading for Kirk, well, the Blue Jays made it very clear that they believe they were too right-handed heavy and they wanted to clear up some room in their outfield. So you could say, okay, what about an, a left-handed hitting outfielder? Well, the Cardinals have one of those and Lars Newbar. That would kind of make sense. That would be a trade where I think Lars Newbars had a really encouraging second half in 2022. I thought he was one of the most impactful players on the Cardinals roster. I think his ceiling is substantially higher than it was in 2021. Would the Cardinals feel comfortable losing Newt Bar if they were gaining a catcher that they desperately need and throwing in a couple of pieces because it would not be a one-on-one -on -one swap? Probably. Now, the A's are in a much different spot than the Blue Jays. The A's are in a teardown and rebuild mode, so they're going to want a prospect hog, right? So Cardinals have plenty of prospects, but as we know, they're really high on a lot of them for good reason. There's Jordan Walker, there's Mason Wynn, Tink Hentz. It depends on what the A's are looking for in terms of what they're building and what they believe Sean Murphy is, his overall price is. And they're very high on Sean Murphy because they know they can get so much in return for him. So I think that's very team specific. And I, that's why I think it's going to be a little bit before the Cardinals do finalize their, their starting catcher. I am. I, I will say, though, I am going on vacation next week, which means they'll probably Something's do happening. something then. <laughs> yeah. uh, so maybe. But it really, I think, is so team specific if they do end up trading for a catcher on what the return would be. Yeah. So you, when you were Mo called the press conference and you were on vacation at that, that time or out of town or something, right? And you had to come back early. Yes. Yeah. So yes. it's definite. Something's happening while you're gone. So that you that you will have to come back, or you'll have to join via Zoom or something to be able to watch. And I, I think we'll send we'll send a staff writer. I told <laughs> um, I told one of the guys in the front office. I was like, "Hey, I'm going to Mexico for ten days, <laughs> and I'm going to send you the itinerary so you know exactly when not to make any moves." And uh, I don't think they're really going to listen to me, but we'll see. Well, um, we have a lot of questions coming in, but um, someone also specifically asked about uh, Danny Jen uh, Jansen yeah. in that in those possibilities. Is he one of those target type options as well? That came from Cody uh, on Facebook. Yeah, I think I. Although I don't think the, the Blue Jays have three catchers on their forty man, <laughs> I don't think they're going to be on the young one. They're they're 
uh, Blue Jays top prospect or top catching prospect there. I think it is between Danny Jansen and Kirk. Um, it, again, it just depends on what they're looking for. The Cardinals are going to value defense from their catcher, I think, a little bit more than your average team just because they know. They know it is unreasonable to compare anyone to Yadier Molina, and they, nor do they want to do that. But there is no denying the impact that defense has, especially from a catching position with the Cardinals. So I think they're always going to lean a little bit towards more defense over offense, but it certainly won't be like an 80-20 split. They're looking for a significant bat. Cardinals are looking for a bat throughout their entire roster as well. So if you can, if you're Mo, if you're the front office and you can land a catcher with some pop, that addresses two birds, one stone. And now you have ample resources to go perhaps add another outfielder or maybe some pitching depth. So all of those things are on the table. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. Look, before we move go. on from catcher, I, there's one more question from Donald. I'll put you on the spot. Who do you think is the starting catcher for the Cardinals next year? I don't know. I don't think it's <laughs> Contreras. I don't think it's Contreras, although I do know he wants to be in St. Louis. I just think the defense is too big of a, of a liability for them. I think if you're looking again, if you're looking for the best overall catcher, that's Sean Murphy, but we don't know his asking price and might be too high. I, I would say if, because we know what the blue Jays are looking for right now and the Cardinals have an obvious fit, I'll go Kirk, but I also know the Cardinals don't always seem to do the most obvious of moves. Right. That's so true. that's a risky, it's a risky thing to say Kirk, but I'm going to go with it. Well, that's what I was going to say. I mean, it's the Blue Jays and the Cardinals have matched up for trades in the past. I mean, if you remember not too long ago, Randall Gritchett got traded for, I believe that was Dominic Leone and maybe a throw another throw in pitcher. So they've, they've teamed up for trades before you had the Blue Jays trading to Te Oscar Hernandez today, which opens up an outfield spot like you were talking about. I know people have said maybe they'll be in on Brandon Nimmo because they need a left-handed bat, but it would seem logically like th there's a potential matchup of, for their for a trade there, and like you said, it wouldn't be as high as what the A's are going to be asked for. Because my understanding, and you would know better than we would, was the Cardinals weren't anywhere in on Frankie Montas because their ask on him was still so high during the middle, you know, the season with the trade deadline. So um, it's going to be really interesting. Was Colby Rasmus traded to? The, he was traded to, to the Blue Jays as well. Yeah, yeah. They, they've teamed up with them before in the past, so that would not surprise me at all. I'm, I'm sure Mo is talking to both teams, oh, yeah. you know, and getting getting the groundwork and kind of trying to figure out. Um, we did have a question here and maybe we can jump into this next topic. Cause I think you've written a little bit about this as well. And correct me if I'm wrong, but we've got a question here from G money on YouTube. We've got a YouTube question. How oh, about that? Here we go. Let me put it up. There we go. Yeah. Is there even the smallest chance the Cardinals may be interested in one of the free agent shortstops? It seems like every year, the last two or three years we've talked about, this is the year they're going to jump in on a shortstop. Katie, is this the year they're going to jump in on a shortstop? Well, I mean, it, all this all this conversation does is remind me that time is like truly a flat circle and we're always <laughs> going to talk about the same things no matter what offseason. I think it's really going to depend on if any of those top free agents are looking for a condensed year deal. The Cardinals, even with their increase in payroll, were never going to be one of those 10-year, $330 million teams. They um, are incremental. So if you're looking for a Dansby Swanson and you're looking five, six years, that's still going to he's still going to command such a substantial amount of money. So, yeah, the Cardinals might be interested. Is it feasible for their payroll? Which, again, it is going up. But you also have to think about the other avenues in which they would like to improve the club. Middle infield, they have a plethora of options. No, it's not a, you know, very flashy superstar blockbuster name. But they are pretty set in terms of utility players that can fill the infield. So I think, you know, top number one priority is still the catcher. And I think it'd be a little difficult to predict how these all fall because it's all going to depend on how they acquire a starting catcher. But I don't see them right now. Just again, we don't know the the market price, but we know that it's going to be a, guys like Trey Turner, guys like Correa. They're going to be very, very expensive. And that just does not seem to be the Cardinals MO. I do think if they do make a big splash with anything, it will come in a trade. But do you think though, because you had a great Q and a with Nolan after he opted in and we can talk, kind of go in, in depth on that some too but i know part of that q a you know when he talked uh with you about his conversation with mo is he said you know hey there were just some things i wanted to talk to him about in person that weren't relayed as well over the phone and just overall want to know if the team is going to get better with with mo talking about the payroll going up and no one kind of you know pressing in on hey how much you know what are we doing what's the plan obviously none of us were there we know we don't know what right. was said but it seems like those kind of talks would lead us, lead us to believe, and 
The track record doesn't say so, but would lead us to believe maybe they should or might be more willing to jump in on one of these bigger stars. I don't think it's going to be a Trey Turner, but maybe it is a Carlos Correa or somebody like that. If you can get him on a four or five year deal, it'd still be higher. But I would like that better than like probably Dansby Swanson. Well, we said that last year with Correa taking a short deal and, it and Trevor Story and yeah. all those guys, and it didn't happen. But I just I know they're not going to be on a guys like you know Aaron Judge or Trey Turner. We've we've talked about. There's no really reason to to go deep into conversation on that. But do you think that ha- him having those conversations with Nolan, there's a little bit more promise of hey, payroll's going up. We're going to be diving in to to get to get the lineup really where it needs to be because they, they really need. I wouldn't even say one. They they need two more impact bats. If you look at the Astros, the Phillies, all those teams that made it deep in the playoffs, it wasn't just two guys that they had that could could mash. It was at least three or four. Yeah, that's a great point. You look at and it was funny because when Adam Wainwright did his "I'm coming back to the Cardinals and I'm retiring next year" press conference from his car, he was <laughs> like, "Oh, is is Mo on this call?" And we all nodded, and he said. Okay, so it's really interesting because if you look at teams like the Phillies, they all have hitters that can mash. And he basically reiterated exactly what you just said, Josh. Teams that do well in the postseason have guys that can leave the ballpark, not just one or two. Even if you have two potential MVP candidates in your heart of your order, there's a substantial amount of power throughout the lineup. So, yes, I do think that fans should be encouraged by the conversations uh, that Mo and Nolan had that ultimately led to Nolan staying. I think it was a pretty safe bet he was going to stay regardless, but you certainly like to hear a player acknowledge, yeah, we talked about the future of the club and I felt comfortable staying. Um, I don't know, again, where they're going to go because if they decide to trade for a catcher, they can suddenly dedicate their payroll to free agencies right. and, and seeing you know if there's a big bat that they can pull their money for and make a splash, they can do that way. I'm in an unpopular minority here when I actually think their rotation's okay. Now, I know that as a, a Cardinals contingency, we have uh, some, some horror stories when it comes to pitching depth, but I would actually be totally fine if the Cardinals started their season with the rotation they had and maybe look to upgrade at the trade deadline depending on their trajectory of their year. But I would agree that the Cardinals would certainly benefit from having a big, I don't want to say blockbuster because I, I don't think they would do that in free agency. Again, maybe trades, but adding a, a bigger name impact bat for their heart of the order would go a long way. Well, let me ask you this, Katie, and you and I, we've messaged about this a little bit. So I want to talk about your Q&A with uh, Arnado, like Josh was alluding to there, too. But, you know, why did Arnado not opt out? We talked about his the details of his contract and how that he would get $20 million from Colorado, according to the uh, spot rack, Spo track, whoever wants to pronounce it a different way, but uh, websites about his contract. And I talked to the CEO of that company, and he confirmed that he would get $20 million, according to uh, the agent, that to him from Colorado. If he opts in, it goes to the Cardinals. So I always believe that Arnado would stay with the Cardinals, but I believe that he would make the most sense for him to opt out and sign another contract. So from your conversations, which I love the Q&A you had with him, an awesome story on The Athletic, but why didn't he opt out or why? what was the conversation? I know you asked a little bit about it, so I know you didn't put too much about it. So why didn't he opt out and why is he still a Cardinal right now? So I think Nolan's contract is probably what if I, if I could list all the complexities of this contract based with his time, his money with the Rockies, his money with the Cardinals, I think we could talk until midnight, try to explain it. It is so complex. And I mean, not even he knows half of what's going on and that's not really his job, right? It's his agent's jobs and the team's jobs to pay it. He just cares that the check is coming in, but that contract is so complex and so difficult and I remember I was last week in Vegas, uh, a couple of people were explaining it to me and I was like, I'm going to need you, I'm going to need you to email this to me because I'm already lost. We've been talking for 30 seconds and this is still too much. So it's very, it's hard to quantify it just based on, oh, this team owes him this X amount of money. This team owes X amount of money. It's going to fluctuate based on where he opts out. If you're looking just on the decision, Nolan did not opt out because he wanted to be in St. Louis. And I think that is so refreshing in this day and age. And hey, I'm all for players making their best decisions for themselves. If you are a player and you want to leave an organization because you're going to make more money, that is your right. I I mean, who wouldn't leave somewhere to go make more money? Uh, But when you look at Nolan and you look at the third base market in in the offseason, it's projected to be very, very thin. He could have absolutely opted out and renegotiated more money. Or he could have been like, hey, St. Louis, Mo." Thanks for the time. I'm going to opt out. We're going to renegotiate my deal so I can get more money because I'm worth more money. 
he didn't do that because he wants to be in St. Louis and he felt like he needed to honor his commitment. As long as the Cardinals were showing that they were committed to winning, he will commit to playing for them. And I thought that was a really refreshing change of attitude from what we see from superstars. And I'm not hating on them by any means. Again, get your money, do what you need to do. I would do the same thing. But Nolan made it very clear, you know, I feel like the team kept their word with me in terms of trying to win. So I'm going to keep my word with them and I'm going to stay. Yeah. I, don't, I mean, I don't think any of us are complaining about that. And even when we talked about, you know, on our podcast before the opt out decision came, because we said he would, and that freaked everyone out. We said, Hey, we said he would opt out, not that he wouldn't stay in St. Louis. There's a big difference. And from a fan, just a fan side, we're being a you know fan podcast. I told Ryan, I was like, man, I wouldn't blame him one if he opted out because you know, really the only to break down the simplicity of that 20 million, essentially it was if he decided to opt out, that $20 million would be paid directly to Arenado from the Rockies if he, if he decided to opt out. If he didn't opt out, which is what happened, then Colorado sends STL that remaining $20 million to be paid out in $4, four, $4 million each, 2023 to 2027. So that's essentially how it goes now. And, and maybe he did know part of it, or maybe, like you said, he just didn't care. And obviously that helps. Maybe that helps payroll a little bit right, since that's it, kicking back to the Cardinals. But I told Ryan, I was like, man, I – as a fan, you know, have that conversation with Mo. Maybe you have a conversation beforehand. Hey, I'm opting out because I get $20 million right, right off the books there if I opt out. I will re, you know, maybe even sign the same extension right. with you guys, and we'll get that in, like, talk agreement and have your conversation over dinner and all the plans Mo lays out and say, hey, it sounds great. Uh, when you guys make those moves, then I'll – <laughs> yeah, then, then, I'll sign. then I'll sign. And then, so he really, I mean, you know, he really could have strong on this whole thing if he wanted to. And it is refreshing. It is refreshing to see a superstar just say, hey, I'm bought in. I love the city. I love the fans. And none of us here are going to complain about that. But it was a little surprising to me that there wasn't maybe just a little bit more push. I think there, I think almost, I don't know, 90% of players will take, would have taken that opt out for the opportunity to, to take the money. So th that's one of the question becomes, Katie, like, what did Mo tell him, right? That's what we talked about a bit ago. Like, what did Mo tell him? Do you think that Mo guaranteed him anything? Like, we're going to do X, Y, and Z. Like, do you get that sense that there's anything that was given to him that he may know that could be coming or what they're going to try and do? Or do you think he just really loves St. Louis and, and playing for a winning ball club? One thing I, I have learned about Mo over the last two years is he does not speak in guarantees and you can't speak in guarantees in this industry because everything is so fluid, especially right now in the off season. But to speak in guarantees, you're setting yourself up to fail. Even if you're so, so convicted in whatever you're going to do, you simply cannot guarantee anything in this crazy little sports world. Now, I do think, again, Nolan would send videos of himself to Adam Wayne right when he was with the Rockies saying, show Mo, like John Mazzoc <laughs> doesn't know who Nolan Arnato is. I mean, he has made St. Louis his home. He really likes the city. He loves the ballpark. I still think about his first game at Bush Stadium in 2021. We hit that go-ahead home run for the home opener. And it just seemed like in the rain and everything, it was so cool. It just seemed like it was the perfect fit. So when you have a player who is – content and is always competing i mean the thing with nolan is he just wants a chance to win every single day and the reality is there are very few ball clubs where that is nearly you know insured almost every single year you think of a team that is always good and you think of the cardinals so i do think that yeah there was probably some th some things said with mo and nolan that really reiterated like hey we're going to continue to want to win we know we need to make a couple more changes maybe we'll be a little bit more aggressive this off season and it was also nolan saying like yeah i want to be here i want to be here and i want to buy in and i want to win a world series here yeah um with your conversation with nolan um obviously it was after the season was there like just regret of the postseason or like uh, it hurt him the way that he performed um, and he and Goldie, the team, out, how they just went out easily? Like, could you tell that from your conversation with them? We didn't talk about the end of the season too much uh, and talking Who would about want how, to, I guess. Right, right. I'm always <laughs> like, oh, such a great regular season. Yeah. And I just end it there. Um, we talked a little bit about it, but he would bring it up kind of just in like, passing remarks throughout the conversation so he'd be like you know I felt like I had a really great year up until the end or you know I felt like we had a really we had a really good solid foundation we were a good club until the postseason and I also think he took full responsibility him and Paul Goldschmidt both for how the postseason went down um, I remember talking in the clubhouse 
after they were eliminated and no one was close to tears. And what that was probably a mixture of frustration and also appreciation for Albert and Yachty. I mean, that was a very emotional clubhouse for so many reasons that night. But I think the way that the 2022 season ended, I think this was this is good in two parts. The 2022 regular season of Nolan Arenado was one of his best of his career. And he was so adamant coming in. He was my first call when the lockout ended. And we talked about what he did over the offseason because he really did not like his performance in 2021. And we're talking about a gold glove winning platinum uh, or gold glove winning uh, 30 homer, 100 RBI season in 2021. And he's like, that's not good enough. And then he came back with this really strong MVP finalist season in 2022. And it really encouraged him in, in terms of his offseason work. But because of what happened in the postseason, that left a really sour taste in his mouth. So I think it's kind of the best of both worlds. And okay, my offseason training and how I approached the 2022 season really paid off, but I still have to be better. Yeah. Well, and I would say too, I mean, reading that QA that you had with him, the two things that stand out to me are, are one, he does want to win. Like that's the goal now. Like money's not the goal. Probably, I mean, obviously he wants the gold gloves and the platinum gloves. He prides himself on that, but he wants he wants a World Series trophy. So one, as a fan, whatever Mo told him or talked about plan-wise and knowing he wants to win, that's encouraging. And two, like the legacy side of it, because he talked with you about, you know, yeah, it would, it would be awesome. Like already envisioning himself getting a red jacket. He's like, I got to be here for a little while to make that happen. Mm -hmm. And that's something I thought of too when people were like, well, what if he opts out and goes to the Dodgers? Because he could have done that. I mean, Justin have... Turner, they let Justin Turner go. He just, you know, they, I think he, they declined his option. So they had third base open. Like he very easily could have went to his hometown team. Um, but I think legacy matters. And I think after kind of forcing his way out of Colorado, I, I didn't, I don't think any of us really saw him just, you know, leaving St. Louis high and dry after two years as well, especially when they did what he wanted. So I think the legacy side of it is interesting, but he even told you as well that um, maybe we have like a reverse situation toward the end of his career, kind of like Albert did coming back to St. Louis, because he did mention how cool it maybe would be way down the road to maybe go uh, play for the Dodgers. So I thought right. that was really interesting. Those, those pieces of your Q&A with him were really good. Well, look, we've gotten a couple other questions on Catcher. We've gotten several questions, and we can jump in a little bit on this and see what your thoughts are. Um, maybe Mo's talked to you about it a little bit. Um, but we've gotten a couple questions about people asking, where, where will Jordan Walker be at the start of the 2023 season? Um, obviously, he just tore it up in the AFL. We saw a lot of guys tear it up in the AFL last year that made a pretty big impact on the big league club this year, like Yepes and Newt Barr and some of those guys. So do you think Jordan Walker, and I've already made this call, but I want to hear your call. Do you think Jordan Walker is the starting, let's say, left fielder come opening day? I don't know if I would go that far because while I am super high on Jordan Walker and I think he is an electric talent and I know that you do not need to play in triple a to be a successful big leaguer. Look at the Atlanta Braves um, yeah. and look at the 2022 rookie of the year winner for the national league. Jordan Walker is so, so young and he has been playing the outfield professionally for three months and that is a lot of pressure to put on somebody who's already been named, not just the top prospect in the organization, but a top 15 prospect in baseball. That's a lot of weight to put on a young kid. And Jordan Walker has always impressed me in his conversations, in his poise, in his demeanor. He's a very mature, really special talent. But you have to be so careful with prospect projections. I think we as a baseball industry hype up prospects every single time. And the fact of the matter is you don't just graduate from the minor leagues, go to the major leagues, instant stardom. It's very, very rare where that happens. There are a lot of peaks and valleys. There are many peaks and valleys. So for Jordan Walker, I think he'll get a legitimate shot to make the opening day roster in the spring. If he has an encouraging spring, we've seen the Cardinals reward that kind of performance. We'll look at Andre Pallante. I mean, not even just made the opening day roster stayed with them the whole year and yeah. was an actual critical part in their roster. Uh, Brendan Donovan, they, I mean, I think he kind of got pushed out by blue holes, but understandable. But then when he came up and he started playing well, never went back down. So the Cardinals are open to playing their prospects and their rookies. Um, but you're going to see a little bit of caution because Walker is so new to playing the outfield. I think while he's I'm all for the allure and you want to see him come up because he's going to be so, so special. You also have to weigh, are we hindering his development in the outfield defensively of bringing him up so early? Would he benefit from some reps defensively in triple a 
I really think how he responds in the spring is going to be a big part in that, but I don't think he's the starting outfielder on that opening day roster next year. I told Ryan this situation kind of reminds me a little bit and I could see it going how it went about five. I think it was about five years ago with Jordan Hicks. Um, you mm -hmm. know, Jordan Hicks kind of forced the Cardinals hands on He just blew he him away so incredibly in spring training that he just completely jumped. Right. No, no choice. Yeah. They were like, we can't, we can't, you know, leave Florida without you here. Like, and now there might've been some injuries. I can't remember at the time with relievers and how, how they needed the need that they had. So it might take something like that with Walker, but I think the difference is pitching versus hitting, right? Like the, the jump from double A AA to triple A and, and Jordan's talked about this even in the AFL because he, he faced some pretty top level, he did. I think triple A prospects there too. He's like, these guys can make a pitch on any count. It's not just going to be a fastball. So that is encouraging to see him thrive in the AFL one facing better pitching, but it is probably a little bit, a little bit more of a difference of a guy that can just come in like Jordan Hicks and blow people away as opposed to a hitter trying to jump right in and face major league talent. So I, I get the temp. So let's temper the expectations a little bit. I've maybe fueled that fire a well, little bit. Then my well, question I mean, is, I my question is then who do you think starting the outfield? Yeah. We, let's, we does can that dive mean, into does that. that mean, does that mean the Cardinals have made a trade? Does that mean, because do you think Lars Newbar is the starting right fielder next season? Please don't I'm, tell me Brandon Nimmo. Don't tell me Brandon <laughs> Nimmo, Katie. No, I think that's too obvious. We talked about this. I, right. I don't see the Cardinals doing anything obvious. They never do. It's part of the element of surprise. I think your starting outfield is, has Tyler O'Neill in left field. Um, I know that for whatever reason, he's been circulated as a trade piece, but Tyler O'Neill's trade value has never been lower. Right. Um, Why would you? Right. right. Because when you look at O'Neill and the injuries, like, yes, that ceiling is still high. He's still a 30 30 guy with gold glove defense. You don't trade that. And if you do trade that, you trade him when he's at his peak to maximize your return because you could get a haul for Tyler O'Neill. You don't trade him when he's coming off a really disappointing season marred with injuries. So I think Tyler O'Neill, that's your left fielder. Dylan Carlson, that's your center fielder. Um, maybe you can have the conversation if he switches off from switch hitting. Maybe he just was going through a little bit of a patch in that second half. I'm not willing to write off Dylan Carlson at all based off, you know, a lackluster second half of the season, especially when he was playing with an injured thumb that maybe he didn't let on was as hurt as it was. Um, I, I don't know like where he was on that pain scale, but I don't think it's fair to write him off. I think where the Cardinals look for it, you enter, if you don't trade Lars Newbar, you enter the season or your goal should be to enter the 2023 with Lars Newbar as your reserve outfielder. Um, but the Cardinals have a good amount of reserve outfielders, right? You have Brennan Donovan, Mr. Super Utility. I can do everything. You have Juan Yepes, a promising bat. But the thing with, with the exception of Donovan, with no, with Newbar, Yepes, Burleson, those are all tradable pieces. So I can solidify two-thirds of the outfield in Carlson and O'Neill. And I think that last corner slash reserve, because we know the Cardinals like their utility, I think that's where they address after they find a catcher. Nice. Yeah, I mean, so when do you think a move happens? When's the f when is the first move? What's the first domino to hap to fall for the Cardinals? Because you know, I when whenever the first day that it opened that we can make any moves, people are like, "Where are the moves?" I'm like, "It's the Cardinals. This is gonna be a bit." Oh, yeah. Right, right. Give them some time. Um, yeah. I think we'll see we'll see a lot of traction at the winter meetings, uh, which are three weeks away in yeah. San Diego. So they got to not not during your fire. vacation. No, not during my vacation, although I do have a tendency of treating San Diego like a vacation, like during this Padres series. Um, they have to stop putting these conferences in such fun places. Like, they're just setting me up to fail. Um, so winter meetings is, it's kind of like, the GM meetings is like a little preview, right? And then the winter meetings, I mean, it's it's pretty common for trades to go down during the winter meetings. Like, you could be sitting next to a group of execs at a table, and all of a sudden, you look at your phone, and you're like, they just made a trade. Um I would say maybe around then because there'll be better clarity. I mean, look at the the price for the relievers, for free agent relievers. That market is usually we'll see relievers, and that's like the last group to be addressed in the offseason. But this is the first group that is going this offseason, and they're going for such an exponential price. So I would say give it three weeks until the winter meetings to kind of see the market prices for each position. And then at the winter meetings, teams are going to be more aggressive. You'll have your 40-man roster kind of finalized. You'll have your guys protected. You'll do a Rule 5 draft. Um, you'll have your non-tender deadline has gone and passed. So there's a bit more clarity on what your roster is potentially shaping up to be and who you're willing to move. So maybe winter meetings again, though, totally on brand for them, for me to do it for them. To, I'll be like at Cabo and all of a sudden my phone will go off and I'll be a Cardinals made to trade. 
And I hope you guys think of me when that happens. <laughs> we absolutely yeah, we, we will. will. Like, oh man, <laughs> that that writer better be there, ready to go and do I take good not. notes. I promise you, I will <laughs> not be there. <laughs> well, I, we only have you for about five more minutes, but um, I want to just get to a couple other quick ones. We got tons of questions coming in, but people are asking about Flaherty, plans for Flaherty yeah. this season. Um, it's clear that he's not resigning. Question mark is what uh, Ethan has. Like. Now they've got him through 2024, so he's still right. Arb eligible this year, right? And then they've got him through 2024, and he's a free agent then, right? No, he's set for free agency after 2023. Montgomery oh, is set. Mistaken. Montgomery too. So the Cardinals only have one pitcher after 2023 that is going to be like right. contract contract obliged to be on their roster, and that's Stephen Matz. Everyone else after 2023. <sighs> Miles Montgomery, Flaherty, bueno. Adams retiring. Right. Uh, those those first three though, they are all set to be free agents or their contracts are expiring. Um, so wouldn't you say, Katie, that puts some onus maybe to jump into the the starting pitching market? Now they're not going to get into. I saw today the Justin Verlander news going right. after a Max yeah, Scherzer type contract. They're that's not happening. doing that. But but you know we had Jeff Jones on a couple weeks ago, and one guy we talked about with him that I think they should have been on last off season was Carlos Rodon. Do you think mm -hmm. that's somebody they could have interest in? Because I know all he's talked about, and I think maybe Mo made reference to it. They really need a strikeout, like swing and miss guy. They don't have that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can, I mean, Jack Flaherty is your swing and miss guy, right? When healthy, that is your swing and miss guy. But I understand after two seasons of this, why there is some trepidation for Jack. I do think there's some a need to lock in some starting pitching beyond 2023. I would like to applaud the Cardinals front office for having five starters uh, before November 1st. Usually it's like April 1st and they don't have five starters. So and I think Mo was a little smug, giving himself a pat on the back. No one laughed. <laughs> I thought it was funny. I thought it was funny during the press conference. Um, if you can't laugh at your mistakes, what are you doing? Right. But <laughs> Right. I do think there is a, a, a good argument to be made that they need swing and miss. We talked about what teams what teams have offensively that are successful in the postseason. Well, teams that are successful from a pitching perspective in the postseason generate the strikeout. Uh, the Cardinals are built for long-term success in the regular season when it comes to their pitching. You put that ground ball defense with their big ballpark or their ground ball pitching with their big ballpark and that gold glove defense. That's going to work most of the time, but you do need swing and miss. Um uh, Rodon definitely fits that mold. He is going to be expensive. Um, I don't know what they, I, I do think they, well, again, I, I'm good with the rotation the way it is now. If they are looking for something, it needs to come with multi years of control just to kind of shore up some space for 2023 and beyond. And it certainly wouldn't hurt to have more swing and miss in that rotation. Maybe they go after somebody in the trade market that we're not even thinking of. I mean, oh, sure. that's, that's what, what they do. That's what yeah. they do. Well, well off the top watch, of my watch. head, I mean, even last year, I thought like Shane Bieber maybe seemed like a guy they could go after, but I mean, the Guardians don't they look won. like. Well, yeah, they, they look like they're yeah. they're wanting to compete, and you they know? have low. They already have a low payroll as well, right? Like Shane Bieber is a you know big chunk of that payroll, probably. Like there's their low payroll, and it's easy for them to keep him and add little bitty pieces. Um, I mean, so we you're, our time's up here pretty much with you, but so let me let's you know I you know like Woj has his Woj bombs. I always say woo bombs because you always out you always get everyone bef everyone in the market that's been there forever. <laughs> you're the one beating them all to the punch. Not and all, always they beat me too, but uh, thank you. But I always say the woo bomb. So what is going to be the woo bomb? What are we going to hear first? What is going to happen first? I want your prediction, not your um not your news, but what's your prediction of what's going to happen first for the Cardinals? And we're all going to go. All right, Katie with the woo bomb. I mean, let's go with something that they haven't been linked to at all. This is just for fun. This is there's no there's been no reporting in this statement. I'm just like speculating. We won't clip to, you out right? of context later. Oh, yeah, on this. No, this is I'm gonna, seriously. I'm just playing I'm the game. This, I'm already going to edit it and ready to go. I'm. It's going to be clipped and put on, on everything. Love that about you guys. Um, <laughs> I think the Cardinals trade for James McCann, Ooh. and but then they sign. An, or then they have the the money, the free agency to sign another starting pitcher. I don't think he fits what we just talked about at all. But I think oh, I've always thought Chris Bassett would be a perfect Cardinal. So there's that, my yeah. there's my very uh, uneducated. Would this be fun prediction? All right. Well, there it is. I'm I'm gonna clip that and we're gonna yeah. put it on Twitter later. <laughs> right. And Katie right. says this is what's happening. <laughs> Her reporting has led her to this conclusion. No, no we I do just that, come I up. Those are two names they haven't been linked to. That makes sense. Yeah. So let's go with that. Well, and that's look, I always I'm on the mind of give me six starters. Someone's going yeah. to get hurt. Yeah, the, you need. I mean, every single year there's a guy that's on the on the injured list for an extended amount of time. So like 
go ahead and get that six starter and and just go ahead and go get Jacob Degrom, man. There's I'd rather have I'd rather have Rodon <laughs> personally, but yeah. Well, it's going to be interesting, whatever yeah, they do. So absolutely. Katie's going to be on it unless she's on vacation, and then she'll she'll step away from the yeah, beach. Yeah, then enjoy. At. I don't know who it's going to be, but they'll do a great job. <laughs> well, it'll be fun. Enjoy Mexico. Yes. I'm I'm going to be in the Cancun area next weekend myself. So nice. It's what we deserve. Yes, <laughs> it is. Well, uh, Katie, we really appreciate it. Um, we everyone can follow you on Twitter at Katie J Wu. Find all your articles. Sign up. Subscribe money, to subscribe. the athletic. Oh, you're athletic. so nice. Thank it's you. Great. Thank it's you. great. It's great. All of your postseason stuff is just as good as your your well, postseason off season stuff is just as good as your regular season stuff. Um, is I mean, is there anything else you want to plug or give anybody ways to find you or anything? I think I hit no, all of them. No, that, but... that's pretty much it. Twitter, the athletic. Uh, if Twitter dies, maybe I'll try to make my Instagram a little bit more professional, <laughs> but we're not there yet. <laughs> Um, but no, that's, that's it pretty much for me guys. Thank you so much for asking me. It's always a good conversation. Great questions. You guys are do a great job. So thanks for well, asking me on. We really appreciate yeah. it. Um, and let's do this before another year. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'm just, just let me know. I have no concept <laughs> of time. I thought today was Thursday. Okay, I was getting ready for MVP awards and I was like, no, yeah. no that's tomorrow. Um, we, so yeah. we won't ask you while you're on vacation. I yeah, promise. Absolutely. Okay. Deal. All right. Thanks Katie. We appreciate Bye, it. Guys. Right. See, See ya. ya. Bye. All right, well, Katie Wu um, was some good stuff. I mean, I always enjoy talking, hearing from her, talking to her, and reading her stuff. I mean, what do you take from the things that she said? Um, you know, are you are you excited? Does it seem like there's probably less going on than what people are talking about? That's what I get from it. Like, I think everyone gets real hyped. A lot of conversations on the radio. A lot of conversations being written down. That there's probably not as much big things happening and stirring around that people always hope for, and that's really not going yeah. on i mean even what she said at the end there with kind of her fun prediction she said it in her article a couple of days ago she does not believe that anything's going to happen beyond catching until they until they right. get the catching situation handled she i mean she well, said yeah, you're not going to spend the money no yeah she said you know obviously it's imperative to remember that it's early in the winter um but the front office has expressed a desire to nail down a catcher before making any other moves so right you're not going to see anything because yeah. let's say that's the biggest hole right let's say they end up having to sign Contreras, which i'm still on board because it only is money right i would rather do that based on just on the other options because of prospects um but let's say that they end up having. I mean, to as sign. long as we aren't including the next Sandy Alcantara and the oh, Sean gosh, Murphy deal, that's my worry, right? <laughs> you give up Gorman or you give up something, and then they're going to be the best players in baseball, right? Um, but I think whenever you you have that worry, and then you need that money, and then that's going to change all of your other moves. Or you go and trade for a guy. Now you have this money to be able to sign a bigger name or bigger amount of money per year. Yeah. So this is the move that has to be done first, and it makes perfect sense to me. Yeah, it does. Um, the James McCann thing was interesting. That you know, she was trying to throw out a name there that none of us are, are thinking about. He's the one that the Mets signed on a fairly big deal. I think it was a couple of years ago, or maybe it was last off season. No, it was a couple of years ago. It was twenty twenty one. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, that you know, he's thirty three. He's owed twelve million in twenty twenty three and twenty twenty four. Free agent twenty twenty five. I mean, what, what are his numbers? Not great. Yeah. He he didn't have a great season. Now he had a, he had a he had a no yeah twenty twenty one twenty twenty two offensively at least I, I'm not looking at his defensive numbers sure. offensively was was pretty bad. Uh, he had a really good twenty twenty season. Twenty nineteen was an all star. So you're talking um, about making it cheaper. The the Mets would have to take on some take off some of the money. Yeah, depending on who we kicked over in a trade. Right, it would be you cheaper know. based on prospects. Now that makes. But sense. if that's a short term, if that's a short term window yeah. you want to do to bridge a gap to sure. Herrera, then I could see why that would make sense and as a stopgap for the next two I, years. I completely agree. And a lot of people are already off on Herrera, but Her Herrera played like started like sixteen yeah. games. Yeah. Like it's way too soon to make any judgment on what Herrera, Ivan Herrera is going to be, and it's it's he's like twenty two or twenty three years old as well. Like he's yeah. super young. He played sixteen games in the majors. His if you look at what Yadier Molina did in his first sixteen games, I'm sure it was just as bad hitting wise. Oh yeah. Um, and you know, and he was he was also following up a all star catcher and and Mike Matheny, one of the best catchers there was at the time too. Right. So like. I think we have this, it kind of goes back to the Albert Pujols and, and prospects. We get a little jaded about what is supposed to be great and what we expect from a certain position based on seeing the excellence that have come through uh, St. Louis. I think that's a big part of it. Yeah, yeah, it is. 
Um, just thinking back to our conversation, I wish I had asked her on the Jordan Walker topic if he would be the starting right fielder. I don't she, know why. She didn't I think, don't know why I said left fielder right. because I, I do think that I don't. She didn't think he was going to start. She right. Didn't, she didn't right, know that right. he, he. She wasn't even con- convinced that he was going to make the roster. Yeah. Out of she said team. he would get a real shot. Yes. And, and to me, they that say means that someone year, else but... is got to be there. Yeah. Like if or or an injury, injuries well, that might true. happen. You but know, my thoughts are, if, if you're talking about the starting outfielder outfield right now a healthy outfield it's o'neill carlson newt bar i mean you're, you're if not, i picked you're, today of who they have right on the roster. but you're not going to that out of spring on purpose right i hope not right i that's what my point is i mean you're going like you're off of doing you're, it on purpose you're going off of hopes right you know we hope Tyler O'Neill stays healthy because we know what he can do when he's healthy. Hope hope. Any, you can't hope this year for that. You have yeah. to get something else. So I think if those are the three that are starting out of out of spring, there is an injury involved. And I think if those are the three options, then then Jordan Walker probably is on this lineup, you know, is on this roster. Right. Because he's going to be there to get his opportunity. Because you're not going to, I mean, no offense to Lars Newbar, I love Lars. Big fan of his energy and everything that yep. comes with it. But you're going to give Jordan Walker the opportunity here and there to get his feet wet. Instead of Lars Newtbar, you don't think Lars Newtbar is a ten-year pro, probably, right? You think that right. Jordan Walker is going to be that. If he is, he's. I mean, if Lars is, he's going to be kind of like a you know Schumacher type that you know you like to have off the bench. He's gritty. He hustles. I mean, look, he he had. If you he go had back great and second half, he had a great second yes. half. If you go back and look at his numbers, especially exit velocity and all those Absolutely. barrel percent, all those things that we're looking at analytically now. You know, he worked on that stuff. Absolutely. So it looked great for him. Honestly, I hope, kind of hope Dylan Carlson works out with him this Absolutely. off season and gets in the same hitting lab with him. To be honest, um, but yeah, I think I think if we see that, it's going to be yeah either an injury or something like that, or they've went and surprised us and have gotten you know a Sean Murphy and Dansby Swanson right. or Carlos Correa, you know, filled in the offensive gap somewhere else, um, but. I mean, I think Walker should get every chance in spring training. And if you got like Newt Bar is struggling really badly, I, you probably still give him a long leash in stri- spring training. But I, I th- mean, I think it means there's someone signed. Yeah. I mean, uh, what's the tie right now to the, the Rays guy, right? Isn't there a conversation that has happened oh, there? Oh, Kevin Kiermaier. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, well, Bob Nightingale said that, you know, the Cardinals could have interest. Could, right. But there's probably, that is probably something. But he's he, another defensive guy. He's like an older Harrison Bader. Right, and I think the Cardinals down the stretch really missed a Harrison. Bader. Yeah, they really did because their identity is that defense. And I think, and now look, if that is the way that they go, I get the frustration from fans because we need more bats. Right, but, but it wasn't the defense that that it was beat us in the Philly series. Those were both low scoring games. No, you're you're right, but it was it was. Uh, it was down the stretch with Overall, Dickerson. Yeah. It was down the st- stretch when you had plays that weren't made that you were like, ah, Harrison would have had that. But Jordan Montgomery did everything you needed of him as well. Right. So it was kind of just like not as solidified as an out- outfield that you had under Harrison Bader. Now, I don't think Harrison Bader is going to be this world beater that he was in the playoffs for the New York Yankees yeah. either. But I can understand going to get a defensive when when Carlson's in right and there's a really good defensive center fielder in, in that lineup, it's a much better defensive team. And that's what the Cardinals have said that and if they don't go and get a Rodon or someone else, they need as best defense as yeah. they can get because there's gonna be a lot of balls in play. Look, again, that's fine if you go get some offensive power at shortstop or at DH You're right. or at catcher or whatever it is. I mean, it's just like Katie and you and I talked about. I mean, they need they don't just need one bat absolutely to protect no one. I mean, they had that. They had pools. He was that guy, and he did it. You have great. to. Re- you have to replace. You need four. You need you two more guys. You shockingly have to replace Albert Pujols again. Yeah, like you have to. What Albert Pujols did in the second half, you have to find that guy that does that all year. I don't that, know if he's and that out could there. Could be in free Tyler agency. O'Neill though, right? As well, it could. And it should what, be. That's if he's what healthy. you thought it was going into the season. Of like, wow, just think if Tyler O'Neill was hitting the way he did the previous year, and then you had Albert Pujols doing it, that it lengthens that oh, lineup yeah. greatly, right? And then you also have Nolan Gorman. And I swear, I'm telling you, Nolan Gorman's going to hit 30 home runs this year. And people talk about they want Joey Gallo on this team. No, like he is a. Cheap, he's a worse version of Nolan Gorman. There, people are going to ha- would hate Joey Gallo. Like if you, people are upset about Nolan Gorman, Joey Gallo is a career 185 hitter, but averages 35 home runs a year. Like you, do you think that's a guy that the Cardinals fans are going to like? 
No. No, it's not, it's not going to happen. I'll tell you what I could see Nolan Gorman doing next year. I'm just going to read off a quick little stat line here. I'm going to see if you can guess who it was. Boy, I think I already know. 32 <laughs> home runs, 75 RBIs, only hit 224, but he had a 338 OBP, 480 slugging, 817 OPS for a 131 OPS plus. So 31 percent above league average someone did this this year or was it someone did this this year they are not on the the cardinals and i'll just give you is it an al i'll I'll Mm. give you i'll give you that hint position first base oh gosh uh i don't i don't know he just re-signed with the yankees rizzo Anthony Rizzo. Okay, I was I was leaning that way, but yeah. I, I was thinking more somewhere else, like West. But career low, two twenty four batting average, but thirty two bombs, seventy five RBIs. He missed some games too, right? Yeah, yeah. he only played one hundred and thirty games. Okay. Well, no, um, that's not too bad, but yeah, it's actually a career tied a career high in his home runs for him. He's never he's done that four times now. Is it thirty two home runs in a season? Yes, um, but yeah, the I mean, Cardinals I could see fans Gorman will take. Oh Matt, yeah, but you know what? They'll be hopefully upset the at, slugging would be, they'll be upset closer at to five hundred and fifty to one hundred and seventy five strikeouts. Right, but Dansby Swans. People talk about they want to sign Dansby Swanson. People talk about they want to get Joey Gallo in there. These guys strike out a ton. I think Swanson was top five in strikeouts last year in the majors. Like these are not Cardinals types of guys. But if you're talking about bringing those guys in, then why are you hating on on Nolan Gorman every day? I do believe Nolan Gorman will hit. 30 home runs. He did so last year between the AAA and majors. I do believe he'll do it. Uh, Donald is saying, let's bring up some more. Yeah, Dansby Swanson had 182 strikeouts this season. Right. That's a career high. And the most was, uh, Schwarber, I think, was 200. I do believe he was dead at 200. Yeah. I do believe. So the more I look at Swanson, man, look, I mean, all- 2022 is his big, I mean, that was his best year. Best year. Now, he hit 27 home runs in 2021 as well. He had some... He's been showing some pop the last two years, but everything else is not very good. OB, no. OBP is terrible. The slugging is not even over 450. He's been a, he's been a good pro, but he's yeah. not. Yeah, well, he's, he's always been really good defensively. Yeah, but he's not this. He's not, not a he, superstar. If we went and signed him to a five-year deal, it would be the next Dexter Fowler. It, In terms of, like, your expectations and then what actually sure. happens, it, it But I'd be fine be with it as well, to be honest. I would because I, I love Tommy Edmond, but you got to do something – you have to find bats somewhere, and if you got to make, you those have to find power. We need power, power somewhere, some more power somewhere else. Uh, Donald asks, Yepes at DH could be the bat to protect Arenado. Maybe. I mean, he has good. He doesn't have splits, right? So Nolan Gorman, yeah. obviously, he didn't get tons of head bats against lefties, but he has extreme splits. Um, and so Yepes, if Yepes is is playing um, every day, gets enough at bats. He's getting tons of bats. Yes, but he had he was streaky of sorts last year. Obviously, he got injured last year. I think that those guys are going to get opportunities. I think Yepes and Donovan and uh, Burleson are going to be get opportunities. And we're not even talking about Gomez, right? Added That's to, what I was going to say. We're going to see the, how high. We're going to see who they're highest on. I think right. we're going to find out this offseason because he's going to get added by Friday to the 40-man. Mo, uh, I, I think he already was, wasn't he? Yeah. Oh, yeah, well, so, yeah, he might already be. Yeah, oh, Friday's a non-tender deadline. Right. They have one too. spot remaining currently. Yeah. So we talked about this earlier via text, you and I, that we have a lot of – okay outfielders ready that can be shipped anywhere. Like, you got to right. think about it. Like, Yepes is a good player. He's young. Burleson, good player. He's young. Um, New Bar. New Bar, good player. He's young. Carlson, good player. Gomez, he's young. Gomez, potentially. Gomez. I think that's where you're, you are you got to trade from. You got to trade from that, yeah. From that p- pool, but also then you're going to throw in your non-top-tier prospects. Not Jordan Walker, not Mason Wynn, not Tim Kentz, not Graceffo. Like, you're going to go to the lower level. So you're going to throw in one of these major league-ready guys, and then a lower level prospect to get something you want. And I am again one that says pay the money instead of trading out those prospects because it's the Cardinals and it's obviously going to come back and get you. Uh, a Rosarena, Adolis Garcia, Al- Alcantara, Gallon, who else? There's just yeah. all of these that come back and bite you of what you've traded away. So I would rather sign if you if it was me, I would say sign Contreras just because you already know he has the bat. And right. I'll take the route. He's got a good arm. He's his, not awful his defensively. Pop, his pop time is top ten in, in yeah. majors. So it, like he has those abilities. And I was uh, thinking about this the other day as well that you know if we get to the point where there's an automated strike shield in two years, his his framing stuff doesn't even matter for any of these guys. That's true. There's no framing doesn't matter at all. And Mumps Sean, are going to be looking at that scoreboard. Yeah. And whether it says a you know striker ball. And Sean Murphy has one of the best framing numbers in all of baseball. That's a great man. I wish it's, we would ask Katie that. I didn't even think about that 
on the on the framing thing. It's yeah. not going to matter. It's irrelevant in a couple years. Yeah. So like that's like taking away a what how we judge analytically catchers. some of these yeah. catchers right I now. I mean, really, what you're going to be looking at is pop times, yes. their arm strength, you know how what their percentage of throwing runners out. They're right. trying to steal. That's what's that's going to be the most. number one thing for a catcher, and obviously running uh, the. Yeah, the, the, pitch, staff. the pitching staff. But like, which there's been questions with the Contreras right. around that, or some criticism. Right. But like Contreras' top, pop time is like tenish in yeah. in majors, and and Kisner was like 35th. You know what I mean? Like there's like, and so that there's a big difference there. So I think that you can get away with that because it's just money. And then for people to think, well, then you're going to take money away from a different area. I really don't think the Cardinals are in the shortstop market. I don't think that they would. I don't think that they will. I wish that they but would. But I w- I, I'm all on it. Trust me. Mainly because that's where the I think the best offensive upgrade can be found. Right. Whether that's it's why Trey you do Turner, it. Turner, probably not. But Correa, maybe Swanson if you want that's some That's why you do it, right? Is yeah. because the bat. That's why you make that trade. And you do it, and then you can trade from you can trade from that surplus because you make that trade to give you some other options, whether that's pitching or you know if you don't if you don't sign Contreras and you have, need a catcher spot, but as Katie said, they're going to make the catcher move first. That's what it seems like. I mean, she said if something you know, the right opportunity presents itself to strike, that they will still do that. But I mean, it's not going to be signing a free agent. You know, like Rodon. I don't see them right. doing something like that before and, getting a catcher. Well, usually stuff doesn't happen like that. You're talking about a, a top tier, right. really a top tier starting pitcher. He's not signing until probably Verlander. I think Verlander. Well, actually, Degrom resign a resign I, with Verlander. I could see happen sooner because it's a yeah. resigning. Well, but like free full free agent going somewhere else. That's after winter meetings. Yeah. It's, well, and it's, it's after the biggest guy falls. Right. Like nobody nobody signed until Scherzer signed, and then all the right. other pitchers started signing. You got to set the kind, market. Yeah. Any, I mean, he set his own market, but right. well, but at least it, but the other pitchers are looking for yeah. someone to set that market. Exactly. To be able to Degrom's going to be that guy this off season, and then and then Verlander as well, and then we'll start seeing a whole lot more. We'll see Bassett go and Rodon and all those other guys. What? And by the way, I'm perfectly fine with having Bassett as yeah. a Cardinal. I mean, adding another pitcher, I'm all for it. You're, I saw a list of top available starting pitchers. He was in the top five of the available pitchers. I'm all for it. He doesn't. He's not a strikeout guy like no. we like we need. But I'm thirty three years old. Pitched over one hundred and eighty innings. Um, but also, you got to think next year. Yeah, you have Stephen Matz. Three four two ERA was fifteen and nine. Look, I mean he he's not he's not bad at all. Um, not bad at all. Strikeout per nine is eight per three, which isn't awful. It's not great, but it's not bad. Um, yeah, one hundred sixty seven strikeouts and one hundred eighty one innings. Yeah, Bassett's not. I mean. If they could get him on kind of a you know two to four year pillow type deal just to get have another guy in there after because right. it really it and we didn't dive too thick into it. Um, Katie probably doesn't have a ton of reporting for it yet. I mean, we could ask her opinion, but it really does not seem like they're going to be able to hold on to Flaherty. No, it's just because there's they been want so much. Either. Yeah, there's just been so much scrutiny there between him and Mo and some of the stuff this year and letting them know about that injury and he was mad about that and then he's. You know, he's out of principle, has, you know, kind of stood his ground on arbitration hearings and right. all that stuff. And it just seems like he's not um, the Cardinal Way type guy that right, they but want, he's, maybe. He's also not playing well. Well, and he's, he's, and he's he can't injured. stay, he can't stay can't on the mound. Stay right, can't right. stay so, on the mound. Like, why? It's kind of like Alex Reyes. Like, but, why does he belong? But, you know, after next year, he'll, he'll, sign, he'll sign with the Dodgers for like five or six years and be I amazing. I don't think the Dodgers will give him that. Type of deal either. I, mean, I don't they, think he's gonna get a. I don't think he's gonna get a big long time deal deal because he can't stay healthy. Um, Brad Poole might need asks, by them, "What about Xander Bogarts?" I would I like love, Bogarts a lot. Yeah, absolutely. I wish we had brought him up. Um, man, that that wasn't a name that we forgot. I, to, I thought about. We were talking about him last year. He's probably gonna want a lot of money too. I I would imagine like probably. What's, what, what's his age? He's in his thirties as well. He he just turned thirty October first. Okay. Um, I mean he's gonna want. I would say probably more than Correa. I think he had his lowest offensive output. He's not going to get as much as Turner. I think he had his worst offensive year to date this season. I do believe. Well, so power wise, right? Yes, yes. So his OPS plus was one thirty one, was act, which is actually the highest it was since uh, twenty nineteen when it was one thirty nine. But the issue was he only hit fifteen home runs this year, and he and, can also be a second baseman because they talked about yeah. he's um, he's not a great defensive shortstop, right? He can play second base, and you can keep Tom. He probably could, yeah. Well, this this uh, on Baseball Reference actually has him as shortstop and third, but I would imagine he could play second too. Yeah, absolutely. So like, I'm but I'm thinking if you sign him to a three four year deal, yeah. you can bring him, you can move him around if needed if he can't play as well as you'd like defensively. And but he would if be you do in, that, if you do that, then you're you could 
you're you can move guys. You He'd can, be an ideal like leadoff hitter. Absolutely. The guy has an OBP over 365 the last three seasons. 2021, yeah. it was 370. We talked last about him year last was 377. We talked about him last year because they were talking about trading him. Uh, because you know, will they get rid of him? Will they not? What are the Red Sox going to do? He's they, a very good hitter, man. I I like, would be very good hitter. I would be like, all about Xander. Only Rogers. had 15 home runs, but then 38 doubles. Right. You know what I mean? Like 73 RBIs. He had 73 RBIs, and that Red Sox offense was pretty terrible. And they yeah, and they were 14 games out of first place. Yeah. His OPS is consistently over 860. I mean, he would be a very good hitter to get. I just, I, I don't know what the market is for him, but I know he's gonna he's gonna command much more than Dansby Swanson for sure. So just go ahead and say like at least twenty five to thirty million a year. Is what what he's, we're gonna talk about like we did last year though. There's gonna be an odd man out probably, right? Yeah, the, the st- I could see Swanson being the odd man out honestly, and kind of like story do was. You, does and Correa last year as well? There was an odd. He didn't. He took a short deal because yeah. of that. Like, do you think that Xander? Uh, sorry, do you think Swanson then goes back t- to the Braves if it's, if a, it's, shorter if deal, it's a shorter deal? Maybe they have young guys ready to come up too. Like, and and they have a big payroll. Yeah, I read today that that even if you know if Swanson or if uh, yeah if Swanson leaves, that they won't dive into the shortstop. Yeah, market. because their payroll is like two twenty right now. Yeah, because uh, they, they're s- set pretty much everywhere going forward for the next ten years, except shortstop. But I think shortstop they have a young guy. Ready to go. So yeah, Man, I could see. I totally forgot about Xander. I like him a lot. I do. I I'd be all for Xander Bogarts to be the shortstop, and then yep. and Tommy has to be your second baseman. Then Gorman's got to be your DH and platooning DH, uh, and then maybe you sh- maybe you trade Donovan. I don't know. Or Yepes, you trade or, Yepes or Mubar right. or Burleson. But you all, there's always going to be an injury too. Like, well, yeah, there's always yeah. going to be the opportunity. Like we we put together we the teams the. The GMs, them, everyone, they put together these teams and like, all right, here's our team. But it never ends that way because of no. all the injuries. Someone's going to be out for the season. Someone's going to have this injury. Someone's going to miss 30 games. Someone's going to have plantar fasciitis and miss a bunch of games. Like, like if you told me the beginning of last year that the Cardinals are trading would trade um, an injured um, Harrison Bader, yeah. I wouldn't believe you. Yeah. Like, you know, and I mean, that Albert Pujols would have more home runs than Tyler O'Neill. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Like there's a lot of those types of scenarios. Like it, it just doesn't end up the way that no. you, that you think. Um, we just got to keep our fingers crossed that the two things that have been the most constant continue to happen, and that's Goldie and Arnado playing about 150 to 100, you know, 55 games. Yeah, and we're year. not even talking about Goldie's demise at the end of the season. Like, yeah. are we worried? Is this the beginning? Of the, is this like what we saw with Matt Carpenter the second half of whatever it was, 2018, 2019? And he has two years left. Goldie. Yes, this yeah. year and next year, yeah. Yeah, so like you think about that part of it, and then you just said a key word as well, Matt Carpenter. Matt Carpenter. Do you yeah. want to do you want to talk about that and then be done here? So Matt yeah, Carpenter. We can finish on that. So Ken um, Ken Rosenthal wrote an article how he saw, said Matt Carpenter fits the St. Louis Cardinals again. I can see it. Please no. Look, Matt Carpenter was a Matt Carpenter was a great Cardinal. He was a really really good Cardinal. He is going to be in the Cardinals Hall of Fame. He will be a red jacket guy, but his time with the St. Louis Cardinals needs to be over with. Could they sign him and get nostalgia back again? Sure, possibly. Do I want to see that? I absolutely do not. No, I don't think most people <laughs> want to. I, I'm a. I love Carpenter. I got his autograph picture over here on the wall. Like big Matt Carpenter. He'll guy. have a red jacket. I yes. mean, don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. Like, Probably one of the better five-year stretches of, of of a Cardinal that we've seen in a while. Yes, in the last ten years. Yeah, he's one of the, he's maybe the best Cardinal in the last yeah. ten I was years. I to say you like, could argue you could argue he was better in that stretch than Holiday was for us. Right. I mean, yeah, the especially doubles, especially the postseason postseason acc- it, oh, well, too, we, Yeah, absolutely better than Holiday in the postseason. Yeah. The the clutchness of Matt Carpenter in the postseason, that Dodgers series, like all. I mean, what he did in the postseason was was unbelievable and clutch. So yeah, I just don't I just look, he had a resurgence in New York. Please go resign there or go resign somewhere else and and use that yeah. fire. Come back when you're retired, collect your green jacket, get the praise then because I think you can only just water down your legacy. Like I didn't think that he could ever come back for a while and get cheered and he came back and and had such a great moments right in that new and that yankee take series. it don't come back and have yes. to come back to some booze if it's if it's bad again right like just yeah. it, i think it's time to ride off in the sunset but it can be with someone else like you can still play in the league go ahead but i don't, I just don't think it makes sense in st louis like yeah it would be 
And, and Ken, I mean, that was kind of at the end. He was running, you know, just a rundown of things he's been hearing around the league. And he, and he said, he started off with, you know, this is my own speculation. It's yeah. not anything I've heard specifically. But he just talked about how, you know, Carpenter was a roommate in rookie ball with Ollie Mamal. Ollie, right, yeah. Uh, so they're good friends. Um, his transformation last offseason included a visit to Marici's baseball performance lab in Baton Rouge with Matt, Goldie and Arnado. And Matt Holiday. he spent yeah, time with As well as year. hitting sessions with former teammate. Yeah. Now bench coach. So you can draw the conclusions, Absolutely. obviously. Like, But you can also draw the conclusions. And Jeff Albert leaving, who he hated. Right. Yeah, he was you, not a huge fan you of. You can also draw the conclusions of why possibly that's why Arnado stayed is because Mo said, hey, I'm going to I'm gonna sign Matt Holiday to the bench. You know, he's going to be here as well. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you can draw yeah. conclusions of why things make sense, but without any actual knowledge of it, like, kind of like Ken's speculating, I just, it would, look, it's not a splash. It's not like signing Pujols where people get really nostalgia. It's been too short of a time since he's been gone. Like, yeah. it's not there right now. Like, it's not right now. Uh, again, I, I'm a big fan of Matt Carpenter. Oh, but. yeah. I mean, Wish him nothing but success. I mean, even in the Yankees, I hated seeing him in a Yankees uniform, but right. I was like, I, I was, was there. I, I was, was there that Sunday game, the last game of that series against the Yankees when they came, and it was I like was upset when he got hurt. You know, like I wanted him to, to, yeah. to do well for the Yankees. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, that series when he came back, that was the loudest, aside from the pool hole at bats, that I heard Bush all year. Yeah. Was that weekend that he came back. So. Yeah. It's going to be interesting. DH, I really think DH, they're just going to stick internally with that. Unless they trade like Yepes and Burleson or something, but even still, you've got this Gomez kid who, maybe you know, maybe you trade one of him or Yepes and give the other a shot at DH with Gorman sprinkled in with some DH and you know, in terms of you know when he might not be playing second base and stuff. I think, I think they've got enough internal options at DH, and I think the bigger issue is there's not any good free agent bats this offseason right. for DH. Compar- there's really not. Right. Um, talk a little bit about. Um, Goldie, MVP, oh, that's and, tomorrow, yeah. and our giveaway. I have a gift for you, so talk about that for a second. Nice. We'll grab it real quick. Okay, quick. awesome. Yeah, I mean, that's announced tomorrow, right? Yeah. Yeah, so that'll be announced tomorrow, the MVP. Uh, Goldie just won the Heart and Hustle Award. He just won the player vote for most outstanding player for for, for the NL. He won that uh, player vote for that, and Judge won in American League. Look, I mean, this is happening. He's gonna win the MVP tomorrow. I, it would be, I think, it would be a complete shock if, yeah, if he doesn't. I now, mean, I'm kind of sort of uh, hoping that Arnado gets it because I bet on that before the season started that Arnado would win, and that would pay me. A, and they are finals, yeah, yeah, and that would pay me a good deal of money. But I think there's no way that he doesn't win the MVP. And so our Twitter is still up yep. for the the giveaway. We're gonna give away a jersey if Arna if um if Goldie wins. Um, Retweet, it, like it, follow us. Yes. And then we're going to go live next week. So let's, in theory, let's say on what's today, tomorrow's is, uh, so let's say November 17th that Goldie is announced as the winner of the MVP. Next week, you're out of town next week? Starting next Tuesday night. So maybe Monday next week or yeah. maybe even Wi Fi remotely. Remotely, we'll do a, a, a live uh, drawing of all the people of, that, the, winner. of the winner of that um, if he wins. All right, I got something for you. You got something for me, man? Look at this. Pool holes crunch. Now, what you, you guys don't know is we, we don't, we're not in St. Louis. So to get access to things like uh, all the Budweiser cans, which I bought <laughs> uh, like 18 of the Budweiser cans, and jo- I gave Josh some of those. Um, but I also got the pool holes, which can be hard yeah, to find. I'm, I'm, t- I'm, I'm told it's hard to find. Uh, my mom is, <laughs> is part of Schnucks uh, in southern Indiana, so she was able to grab some of them. So I have some. Over there somewhere too, but look at that! Look at that! Autographed in the back, you know. Yeah, I got that specially done for you. Oh, look at that! <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that'll go on the wall with so all the I other got my, memorabilia. Over there on that other shelf is the carp, uh, carpenter crunch over there. So, like you know, the cereal, <laughs> the salsa, and everything else. So we I had the salsa too, and it was good. It was good. It I was, had some of that. Yeah. So yeah. So that's I, awesome. So is that like the um, what was it on uh, Space Jam the the secret sauce the that they had? Sauce, if if yeah. we if we have a bowl of this in the morning, am I gonna be able to hit seven seven hundred nev- home runs? I never opened the Carpenter's Crunch. How do you start giving this to my kid? <laughs> you need to start giving this to Marshall each morning. <laughs> eat up, kid. Eat up. It's time to hit bombs. <laughs> That'd be great. All right. Well, follow us on Twitter at That's a Winter Pod on Facebook on YouTube. Obviously, if you're joining us from there. Um, be sure to be on Twitter and 
for Goldie winning the MVP tomorrow, hopefully on the 17th, you need to retweet and like us and like the post to be able to be eligible. Follow. You've got to be following us. Yes. So whenever I do this, whenever, so this machine is going to grow and grab a winner. So I'm going to do five rotations. It's going to grab a winner. The fifth rotation is the winner. I'm going to, it's going to pull up. I'm going to show it live on the screen. And then I'm going to go look at our Twitter and see if that person is following us. If you're not following us, then I'm going to the next person. So you have to be following us and you have to get, so it's like 400 ish people is in the running right now. Yeah. So there's an opportunity for everyone to win a Jersey for Goldie. Uh, you'll be able to pick your style, I think. And I think your size, yeah. um, and we'll get it, we'll get it out to you. I mean, it's that simple. Maybe even by Christmas, you never know. Maybe. Yeah. I think we could probably make that happen. Uh, follow nice. us on Twitter that at that's winter pod, uh, breaking tea, nothing going on new right now, breaking tea, but breaking tea.com slash that's winter pod. Even if you like the blues yeah, or they've the got, Chiefs, they've got some new blues gear coming Colts, out. I don't know where, wherever you, whatever sports you care about, even college football and college basketball start at breaking tea.com slash that's a winter pod. And then go and search inside that website for other stuff. Cause we get credit at that point. That's how we're able to make a little money. Um, not only from there, but also if you listen to us on Spotify, Google, Apple Podcasts, anywhere like that, you're going to hear an ad. That helps us get some money coming in as well. Yeah. Um, and so listen when you listen that way, we don't really get paid for this part of it, just just listening to us live. We just do this for fun yeah, for this you guys. Is the, yeah, and then we just then we put it on online later. Um, so listen to that, share this, share it everywhere. Uh, we really appreciate it, and we appreciate Katie Wu for being our guest tonight. Yeah, and um, make sure to follow her on Twitter and subscribe to the Athletic. She's got great stuff. She's breaking all the news, man. She the Wu bombs all, all the, the time. scoops. I can't wait for the next Wu bomb. Hopefully, while she's on vacation next week, there's a Wu bomb, <laughs> just because you know it's going to happen. You'll have to text her about it. Yeah, absolutely. All right, thanks for listening. That's the Winter Podcast. As always, I am Ryan Jenkins with Josh Brown. See you. From the belt to the plate, a swing and a miss, and that's the winner! That's the winner! A World Series winner for the Cardinals! Smith corks one into right down the line, it may go! Go crazy, folks! Go crazy! It's a home run, and the Cardinals have won the game by the score of 3-2, to and a home run by the Wizard! lead by the score of seven to five and they may go to the world series on that one folks what a team what a ride the cardinals are world champs in 2011